So in the last video, we had a bit of an overview of how transcriptional regulation is accomplished in eukaryotic cells, and we contrasted that with um, the more promoter proximal and direct regulation that we see in prokaryotic cells. Um, and I'm sure that it occurred to you to wonder, and, and you've been thinking about this, um, and the question that I'm sure that you, th that you thought of is, um, if the pancreatic cell and the red blood cell are expressing different genes, because they are expressing different sets of regulatory transcription factors. That's great, um, but why are they doing that? Uh, when did they start doing that? What causes an immature red blood cell to specifically express these transcription factors but not those? Um, and those are very good questions, and that's what this video is going to address. And the answer in general is that these kinds of cell fate specification programs are set in place beginning very, very early in development. No matter what organism you're looking at, um, we start to see what's called differentiation, um, which takes an immature cell that doesn't really have a defined cell type and causes it to, to initiate a genetic program such that it becomes more specialized or more differentiated. And that begins to happen very, very early in development. For example, in humans, um, you know, our developmental program is nine months long, but within the first five days following fertilization, a lot of the very basic decisions about which cells in this little ball of cells are going to be uh, making up embryo versus extra embryonic tissues like placenta have already uh, been made, and so cells have become restricted in the cell type fates that they can adopt. So what we're going to focus on in this video is um, the developmental regulation of gene uh, programs and specification of different cell types, and we're going to be looking at this as it plays out in Drosophila melanogaster, uh, the fruit fly, because that is the model organism that was used to really investigate and um, figure out how this genetic program is specified in embryonic development. And what we're going to be seeing in Drosophila uh, embryo, embryogenesis is that very, very importantly, localization of mRNAs to specific regions of the cell is going to be a really important mechanism for initiating this cell specification process and, and really kick-starting it. Then what we're going to see is a cascade of regulated transcription factors that start to be expressed in different patterns in different regions uh, of the embryonic body, and that ultimately leads to specification of the embryonic body plan and development of different structures in different regions. All right, so we need to uh, address this question, right? We have a, a fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. It's got a head. It's got a butt. How does it know at this stage of development? And, you know, this little fertilized egg, how is it supposed to know that it, it needs to make anterior structures at one region, it needs to make posterior structures at another region, that there has to be a back and a front and a left and a right? How is this cell supposed to know how it's supposed to progress? And what we're going to see is that in Drosophila, as well as other animals, this process of morphogenesis, which is the development of the body shape and structure, is reliant on chemical signals called morphogens. So morphogens are chemical signals that regulate morphogenesis, right? But the way that they do that is by regulating uh, cell differentiation and providing positional information to cells in different regions of the developing embryo in a concentration dependent manner. And what I mean by that is that we would have a specific mor morphogen, a specific molecule, it could be a protein, could be some other chemical signal, usually it's a protein, and if we have a high concentration of that morphogen, M, then that's going to lead to the specification of cell type A, for example. If there's a low concentration of this morphogen, then that leads to specification of a different cell type, right? So that's what I mean by concentration-dependent manner. So if we express this protein 
and then expose different cells to different concentrations of this protein, we can actually see that initiating different types of signaling pathways or cascades such that we start to uh, turn on different sets of genes and ultimately that's going to lead us to specify different cell fates. Now when does that start to happen? Well in Drosophila specifically it really does happen at this stage. Um, before an egg is even fertilized by a sperm, it has already had established within the, uh, within the egg a axis of polarity along the anterior, posterior axis, uh, a dorsal, ventral axis that specifies back from front. So even though this egg hasn't even been fertilized yet, it already knows that eventually once fertilization happens, this part of the egg is going to go on to, uh, to uh, see the uh, establishment of cells that are going to form anterior structures like the head, like the eye, like the lips, like the antennae. Um, and the posterior region is going to be associated with uh, those other posterior uh, structures. And same for the dorsal ventral axis. So it's back here even before fertilization even takes place. Now in order to understand uh, the initiating steps of gene regulation that happen in Drosophila, we have to talk a little bit about the development of this egg within a female fly. So we have to know something about how that happens in order to understand this regulation. So what we're looking at here is a, follic a follicle. This whole green thing is one follicle within the ovary um, of a female fly. Now each follicle contains one egg or oocyte. So here this large cell outlined in white here, that's the oocyte, that's the egg. But in fruit flies, in addition to that oocyte, there are at least two other cell types that are present that are important uh, for regulating what happens with that oocyte. And we're only going to talk about one of them, which is the nurse cells. So these are the nurse cells over here on the left, right? And they're present within the same uh, follicle. And they regulate and support and nourish uh, this oocyte, right? So that's why they're called nurse cells. These are all cells that mom produced. This cell is a gamete, right? So that's mom's haploid gamete that she's formed. These are just diploid mom cells, normal cells. They produce proteins that the oocyte requires in order to be appropriately regulated and in order to develop appro appropriately. And these proteins are encoded by genes that are referred to as maternal effect genes because these cells, these nurse cells, are actually part of mom. They're not part of the gamete, right? They're part of mom's body. And so these nuclei contain the genes that are expressed to regulate development of this oocyte that we call maternal effect genes because it's mom's genome having an effect on the development of this oocyte once it's fertilized and becomes an embryo. This is the oocyte genome, right, which once it's fertilized um, by, by a sperm, ah, oocyte, um, is going to become the embryonic genome. Right? Once we have fertilization happening, the paternal and the maternal genomes are going to combine within one nucleus, and that genome is then um, going to be the embryonic genome or the zygotic genome. Right? So we combine sperm genome, oocyte genome, and that becomes embryonic as opposed to maternal. Right, so these are cells that are technically part of mom's body. These are the gametes that are going to form the next generation. This genome belongs to the embryo. These cellular genomes belong to mom, if that makes sense. All right, so how does this oocyte, even before it's been fertilized, have that, um, as we said, anterior to posterior axis already established, back to front axis already established? Well, it's reliant on genes being expressed from these nurse cell nuclei. And we're only going to talk about two genes, um, but there are actually a whole host of genes that are, that are expressed in this way. Um, we're going to talk about two, and those two are bicoid 
and nanos. So in this nucleus, the bicoid gene is transcribed. The bicoid mRNA, which is represented as this little blue triangle, is produced. And then it's transported out of this nurse cell into the oocyte and specifically localized to this region of the oocyte. The region of the oocyte that's in direct contact with the nurse cells is where that bicoid mRNA gets localized. A different gene in the genome, the nanos gene, gets expressed within the, these nurse cell nuclei. That mRNA, which is represented by the little yellow sphere, gets transported into the oocyte, likewise. Um, but it gets specifically transported to the opposite end of the oocyte, which is the end that's furthest away from the nurse cells. So just based on the position of these different regions of the oocyte relative to the position of the nurse cells within the follicle, that's how we establish the initial anterior to posterior body axis. Because it turns out that this region that was closest to the nurse cells that has the high concentration of bicoid mRNA is going to specify anterior head structures. This region that was furthest from the nurse cells that has the highest concentration of nanos RNA is going to specify posterior structures. All right? Now, why is that going to going to happen because it turns out that these mRNAs once translated are going to be specifying their protein products, right? The bicoid protein is specified by the bicoid mRNA and so at this region of our developing embryo we're going to have a con high concentration of bicoid protein and at this region of the embryo we're going to have a high concentration of nanos and because proteins can diffuse within the cytoplasm what we're going to see established is what's called a gradient, a concentration gradient. Right? These are our morphogens that we were talking about that are going to regulate how these cells uh, in this developing embryo are going to develop what, uh, what their specific differentiation program and, and cell fate specification is going to be based on the concentrations of these morphogens that those cells are going to be exposed to. Right? So we take a slightly different uh, view of this. Here's um, a light microscopy image of a follicle with an unfertilized oocyte. Here's our oocyte. Um, here are our nurse cells over on the left. Blue is indicating the presence of bicoid mRNA. And so what we can see is that the blue is present here in the nurse cells because that's where the mRNA is being transcribed, remember, from these nurse cell nuclei. It then gets transported into the oocyte. So this is actually inside the oocyte, but then localized and tethered to this specific region of the oocyte. Now, what happens um, during the maturation of this oocyte is that these nurse cells are eventually going to degenerate and this oocyte is going to expand to take up the entire uh, space within that follicle uh, sort of cuticle covering that it has. And so um, a little bit later in development we go from something that looks like this in the follicle where the oocyte's kind of squished over to the side and we've still got nurse cells to a state where the oocyte has really is starting to occupy the entire follicle structure. And so here what we're seeing is the localization of the nanos RNA, mRNA, to what's being specified as the posterior region of the embryo. And this micrograph really shows us very nicely that gradient of protein that begins to be established once that mRNA gets translated, right? The mRNAs are localized here, the protein is synthesized, the protein can then diffuse away from that site where they were uh, uh, created, and we end up with this gradient of protein concentration across the embryo, where the highest concentration is here where the mRNA was localized, and then the concentration decreases as we go away from that. We would see a similar concentration of our bicoid a protein that would be high here and then would decrease as we go further from that site of localization as well. All right, so these are our two morphogens. This is how we establish a gradient of protein expression by mRNA localization within the oocyte. But what are these morphogens? What do they do and how do they do it? Well, it turns out that what they are are genes that encode regulatory transcription factors. And so these bicoid and nanos proteins are going to be interacting with specific 
gene sequences within the genome to activate the expression of specific genes, right? So we're, what we're going to see is that depending on uh, where in the embryo a cell is, it's going to be seeing a different concentration of bicoid and nanos, and that's going to regulate which genes begin to be expressed in that cell. All right, so what we have essentially is early in embryonic development in Drosophila, we have an embryo that kind of looks like this, where we have uh, many individual nuclei all present within a common cytoplasm. This is a result of mitotic division without cytokinesis, so that we have one cell cytoplasm with many nuclei within it. And each of these nuclei is being exposed to a different concentration of bicoid and nanos protein. Over here at the posterior end, they're seeing high concentrations of nanos. And over here at the anterior end, they're seeing high concentrations of bicoid, right? And then low concentrations of the other morphogen. So low nanos over here at the anterior, low bicoid over here at the posterior region. And so in each one of these nuclei that's being exposed to these different concentrations of these transcription factors, nanos and bicoid, these nuclei are going to start switching on different specific sets of genes. And so these maternal effect genes, bicoid and nanos, are now going to be starting to activate gene expression programs in the embryonic genome. So remember we said these are embryonic genes that are now going to start to be expressed within this developing embryo in different patterns based on which genes are getting switched on and off by these different morphogen con uh, concentrations. And so these maternal effect genes and their differential expression pattern across the embryo activate different downstream genes, which we're just going to collectively refer to as the segmentation genes. There's several different classes, but the basic idea is very simple. Based on the concentration of these morphogens, transcription factors that these nuclei are seeing, they're going to start to initiate different gene expression programs. And those are going to be maintained as we go from one embryonic development stage to the next. And so initially what we get is just a very gross, blunt specification of anterior to posterior, dorsal to ventral. And then within that specification, we start to get a little bit finer in our uh, uh, specifications that are going on where we might be seeing specification of anterior structures into head and thoracic uh, versus abdominal regions, right? So we get uh, uh, gene expression programs that are going to be initiated downstream of the maternal effect genes that are now going to control what each and every region of this embryo goes on to develop into being. Every cell at every location along this embryo is seeing a different concentration of different transcription factors. And so every cell essentially is receiving positional information based on those transcription factors um, that tells it where in the embryo it is, right? And initiates the correct gene expression program for that position in the embryo. Now, as I said, we're just looking at uh, anterior posterior. There's a completely different set of morphogens that controls the dorsal to ventral or back to front gradient. So if we imagine that we are, you know, a cell that ends up being positioned here within the nucleus, we are getting positional information along this AP axis based on the concentrations of bicoid and nanos that we're seeing. We're also getting positional information along the dorsal ventral axis. And as embryogenesis goes on, we're going to be getting positional information about left, right, and other structures that are nearby as well. So initially, we, we establish this body plan, AP, dorsal ventral. We start to specify general regions and then finer regions within those general regions based on the gene expression programs that are being established. All right, so this is kind of what we see along the length of a developing embryo is that every single position that, that a cell is at, let's say a cell finds itself in this stripe, is going to be associated with different concentrations and combinations of specific transcriptional 
regulators, right? And so cripple is a <coughs> protein that's regulated by the presence or absence of uh, nanos. And so we see in that specific yellow stripe that we have um, uh, these specific concentrations of these transcription factors and as a result we switch on this specific gene called Eve stripe 2 which defines this specific segment and controls what identity it is going to assume. Now because what we see in Drosophila is this uh, segmentation or striping pattern that gets established along the AP axis that's where this name segmentation genes uh, comes from. So these are the embryonic genes that are now being controlled in their expression by the maternal effect genes, those morphogens that had a different uh, protein concentration pattern along the length of the embryo. So as development proceeds and we go further and further along and approach you know, uh, uh, morphogenesis into the adult, each of those specific segments <clears throat> is going to see different sets of effector genes get switched on finally that are actually going to be responsible for forming the anatomical structures that define that region of the fly. Right at the, at the head we're going to see development of eye, lips, other mouth parts, uh, antennae, and all of those other structures that are characteristic of the eye because these specific uh, gene programs that were established here are eventually going to turn on the effector genes that cause these specific structures to form. Likewise here on the thoracic segments we're going to see you know legs forming on each thoracic segment. On the second thoracic segment we're going to see the development of wings and so on. So every segment once it's once its identity has been established by the segmentation genes is going to be associated with turning on different effector genes and these different effector genes are called homeotic genes. This is certainly one large class of effector genes that controls uh, the specification of body structures on these different uh, segments. And these were identified in Drosophila. We now know that they're conserved across phyla. They're really important developmental regulators. But essentially what happens is that once you switch on a homeotic gene that's expressed in a specific region, that's going to be turning on the set of genes that control a particular body structure, eye, antenna, bristle, leg, right, in that region. And so to see how these things work, we can look at what happens when you disrupt their normal expression. All right. So in Drosophila, there is a homeotic gene called ultrabithorax, which is normally expressed in the third thoracic segment of the fly. So when we're looking at this fly, uh, thoracic segment number one is kind of tucked away up here. We can't really see it very well. This is thoracic segment number two on which the wings develop. And thoracic segment number three is right here. And it doesn't usually develop wings. Instead, what it develops are these little balancing organs called halteres. That's normal development. Now, the reason that this third thoracic segment develops the way that it does is because it expresses this ultrabithorax homeotic gene, which represses all of the genes that would otherwise lead to the formation of this anatomical structure that we call T2, right? And the wings and bristles associated with it. So if we knock out ultrabithorax expression in T3, there's nothing telling this uh, thoracic segment number three that it's not thoracic segment number two. And so what we see happening is that we see a reiteration or repetition of thoracic segment number two, and we end up with a fly that has two uh, thoracic segments number two and no thoracic segment number three, right? So loss of expression of an important homeotic regulator of the formation of body structures leads to disruption of the body structures that are formed, or what's called a homeotic transformation. Another example of a homeotic gene that, that provides pretty dramatic effects when we misexpress it is antennapedia. Antennapedia is a transcription factor that's switched on, and usually it's switched on in the specific regions of the three thoracic segments where we're going to see legs forming. So when antennapedia gets switched on in T1, T2, and T3, at those positions we see genes being activated that lead to the formation of legs in those regions. Well, what if we take that antennapedia gene and instead of expressing it in the thoracic segment, now we express it 
in the head where it's not usually expressed. What we see then is that in the region where these little feathery Arista-like uh, antennae form, instead we see legs forming because of the ectopic expression of Antennapedia in a region of uh, the developing fly where it's not usually expressed, right? Wherever Antennapedia gets expressed, that switches on the set of genes that make leg. And so we see leg being made. Conversely, a gene that's required for the formation of eye, called eyeless, it's normally expressed in the region of the head where the eyes form and it's critical for that formation. If we express that gene in other regions of the fly, then what we see is a phenotype where the fly shows extra eyes. Anywhere that eyeless gene was expressed, we now see genes being switched on that uh, attempt to lead to the animal anatomical structure, uh, the eye, right? They're not normalized, they don't have neuronal conne connections, they don't work, the fly doesn't see through them, um, but you can definitely see uh, these structures forming on other regions, including the legs and along the back, right? So key thing to recognize here is that when these homeotic genes get switched on, downstream of those segmentation genes, they actually flip the switches on the genetic programs that lead to specific body structures forming. Now, if we look at the fly genome, what we would see is a cluster of homeotic genes uh, that are present in a couple of different complexes. These are related to one another. They're a family of genes, and each homeotic gene is, is responsible for a particular body structure specification, right? Um, and so that's what we see in, in Drosophila. Now, are these limited to Drosophila? Oh, no. Hox genes are found actually in all animals in which we've looked. Um, and their importance and development differs depending on which um, uh, uh, phyla you're in, but definitely in all bilaterally symmetrical animals, they're critical for development, they're highly, highly conserved across phyla. Um, so what we see in different species is that there's a whole family of these homeotic um, proteins, these transcription factors that turn on uh, the genes that specify body structures. And these are uh, often referred to as Hox genes, right? These homeotic genes that can cause homeotic transformations are Hox genes, and Hox stands for homeobox. And the reason that they're called homeobox genes is because the transcription factors that they encode have a conserved DNA binding domain. In other words, if you line up the sequences of these proteins that are encoded by the Hox genes across all these different organisms, you see that they have this about 180 nucleotide long DNA sequence that specifies a uh, domain on the protein that binds to DNA, and these are called homeodomains. So that's what makes them so similar in terms of the function that they're carrying out. Now, as we've talked about before, anytime we see this kind of a gene family or superfamily, um, we know that what's happened is that we've seen gene duplication events over evolutionary time, right? Um, we can see non-reciprocal recombination events leading to gene duplication. Uh, we can see translocation events that lead to representation of these genes at different locations in the genome, and both of those seems to uh, seem to have happened uh, many times over uh, evolutionary time, which has expanded the Hox gene family um, tremendously. So here's the idea. You know, originally in some primitive ancestor, uh, we had a Hox-like gene, only one copy. Uh, duplication event, we now have two. Another duplication event, we've now got four. Um, and so in our, you know, early bilateral ancestor, we had a cluster of Hox genes that may have looked something like this, seven Hox genes, right? Even in jellyfish, and we look at in invertebrates, um, like, like jellyfish, we can see that they have uh, relatives of the Hox genes. They've lost some, but we can still detect that there are some genes present that have sequence, sequence similarity uh, uh, to these Hox genes that we find in other animals. Um, if we look across phyla, we see if we come down here to um, uh, arthropods, insects like Drosophila, uh, that we see that cluster that we just saw on the, on the previous slide. Uh, if we look in tetrapods, uh, vertebrates like us, uh, uh, human or mouse, what we see is not one set of Hox genes, but actually that those Hox genes have been duplicated and translocated so that they're now actually on four distinct chromosomes. So we have four sets of these Hox genes, but the sequence similarity is 
uh, you know, leaves no doubt as to the evolutionary relationship between these uh, uh, clusters and sets of Hox genes that we have distributed across four chromosomes and uh, the ancestral uh, Hox cluster that is the evolutionary ancestor to those found in all these other animal phyla. Um, and another region, uh, uh, you know, bit of interesting uh, genetic um, consequence of this evolutionary relationship is that these genes can functionally compensate for one another. Um, if you have an organism that has lost the function of an antennapedia gene, you can actually take the sequence of the antennapedia gene from another species uh, and put it into that organism and it will compensate. It'll be used exactly as the endogenous Hox gene would be. So in other words, you can make a mutation in fly that knocks out uh, antennapedia, take antennapedia from mouse and use genetic tricks to get it into the fly and it will take the place of the Drosophila antennapedia gene. So so just really indicating the evolutionary conservation, not only in sequence, but also protein function that we see in these highly related uh, genes. So because we have multiple copies and, and um, duplicate sets of these homeot homeotic genes, these homeobox genes, um, the, our developmental program is actually uh, quite complex compared to these other animals, as you would imagine, right? Um, and what we see during our developmental program is that we have the interaction between multiple homeotic genes that are specifying these uh, effector genes being turned on and formation of body structures. So we don't typically see the same dramatic homeotic transformations in human that we see, for example, in fly if we knock out one uh, antennapedia gene, or we see misexpression of one antennapedia gene, for example, in human. Uh, you know, those genes are uh, associated with limb development in human. Um, they're not called antennapedia, they're, they're, they're referred to by number, but um, we're not going to see a leg growing out of somebody's head, in other words, right? So we don't see those dramatic effects because we have redundancy and multiple interactions with different Hox genes with one another to specify a developmental program. So we see more subtle developmental effects, typically, right? Not entire missing limbs or other anatomical structures, but alterations in the developmental program, so they're not quite normal. Uh, one example of that, one of the more common examples of that is syndactyly or polydactyly. Uh, syndactyly refers to, at, uh, refers to the fusion of digits uh, in the you know, hands or feet, um, and polydactyly refers to the presence of extra digits. Well, these uh, digit formation is very well characterized to be uh, regulated by Hox genes, and one specific Hox gene in human, Hox D13, if you have a mutation in that Hox gene, uh, that leads to the clinical presentation of syn polydactyly, where you have both fusion of digits as well as uh, extra digits being formed or parts of digits being formed. You can see extra toes, extra fingers. Um, and interestingly, other Hox gene mutations have been identified in human genetic disorders like uh, disorders that affect nervous system development, either central nervous system development or peripheral nervous system development. And there are, for example, peripheral neurop neuropathies that are associated with Hox gene uh, mutation. Um, interestingly, uh, defects in Hox genes have also been implicated in susceptibility to uh, particular cancers, most notably breast and uh, prostate cancers. So they are, you know, very relevant to uh, human physiology and control important aspects of our of our anatomy and development, just as they do in these other organisms, all the way back to fruit fly. Um, and you know, it, it cannot be overstated how much of a surprise it was. Uh, to the biological world <laughs> when the details of development were worked out in a model organism like fruit fly, which I don't think anybody would be able to mistake for a human, but then we discovered that extremely similar genes and gene programs were being initiated in us, in mouse. Um, it, it, it was just a huge shock. Nobody expected that our development would be so highly conserved given how different our anatomy and physiology are. All right, so we talked about a lot of stuff there. I want to just uh, go back a bit and kind of summarize conceptually what we, what we just saw happening in Drosophila development and, and sort of tie it all together. So remember that we started with 
a gradient of these morphogens, bicoid and nanos, such that at the region of the embryo that's faded to become anterior, and remember this was even before we had fertilization, so really in the oocyte, um, we had a high concentration of bicoid protein because bicoid mRNA had been specifically localized to that region of the oocyte. At the region of the embryo that's going to become posterior, we had a high concentration of nanos protein for the same reason, right? Nanos mRNA was localized there. And what we saw was a gradient of expression, right? As this bicoid protein sort of diffuses away from the site of localization, we get this gradient of expression where it's highest here at the anterior end, lowest or, or non-existent here at the posterior end, and the converse for nanos. And so any position along this AP axis is getting information in molecular form from these morphogens as to where it is in the embryo. So if we're here in the embryo, what are we seeing? We're seeing high, high bicoid, right, and low nanos or no nanos at this end. And so let's imagine that these proteins, bicoid and nanos, remember they're transcription factors, uh, they go on to interact with, let's say, just genes A, B, or some set of these, genes C. We've got three ge downstream genes that are going to be responsive to these morphogen gradients. And when you have high bicoid, low nanos, let's say that we see gene A specifically being activated genes B and C stay off, right? And so because we've activated gene A, maybe gene A uh, encodes a transcription factor. And so now we express in these cells at this region of the embryo, transcription factor A. Well, what is that transcription factor then going to be doing? Well, it's going to be, in turn, regulating the expression of other genes. So let's say downstream of transcription factor A, we switch on genes D, E, and F, right? And downstream of those genes, which are also transcription factors, we switch on additional target genes, right? So we now have transcription factor D that's hitting specific genetic targets in the genome. We have transcription factor E that's hitting specific targets in the genome. We have transcription factor F that's hitting specific targets in the genome. And so we get target gene regulation taking place downstream of this genetic program that is going to lead to finer and finer specification of what the cells in this region of the embryo are destined to become. So we initiate a morphogen gradient which switches on a gene, right, this is a very simplistic um, uh, example, obviously it'd be more than one gene, which leads to expression of a specific transcription factor which switches on target genes, uh, which may encode additional transcription factors which are going to switch on additional target genes and so on and so on. So we get this cascade of regulated transcription that leads to these very finely regulated genetic programs that specify the cell fate of the cells that are in this region of the embryo. Here at the other end, what would we be seeing? We'd be seeing low bicoid and high nano, so the opposite scenario. And same genes in the genome, right? These cells have exactly the same genes, but now because we've got high bicoid, or sorry, high nanos and low bicoid, um, we're not going to see gene A switched on. Gene A is going to stay off, and maybe we see gene B switched off as well, or stays off, and instead gene C is switched on. And because gene C also encodes a transcription factor, <clears throat> we're going to see a different set of genes switched on. So now genes G, H, and I, for example, right? Here in the middle region, what are we going to see? Bicoid approximately equal to nanos, right? Now let's say same genes, gene A, gene B, and gene C. But now let's say that gene B is specifically switched on, genes A and C stay off in response uh, to this. And so now we get transcription factor 
B expressed, right? Which switches on downstream genes K and L, whatever they do, right? The key point here is that these morphogens that are initially expressed in the oocyte switch on different sets of genes that encode different transcription factors, which are themselves then going to switch on different sets of genes which may encode transcription factors that switch on additional sets of genes. Ultimately, those uh, target genes at the end of this cascade are going to be genes that actually define the actual identity of these cells, right? So we get this finer and finer uh, specification of cell identity uh, that initiated with these morphogens and their concentrations within the embryo, right? So we get uh, initially a cell that has received information that tells it you're anterior, right? So anything in this region is going to have that very general sulfate specification, but as a result of different genes that get switched on, now we're going to get a little bit of a finer specification. So you're not just anterior, you're head, or you're thoracic one, or you're thoracic two, or you're thoracic three. So still anterior, but now your fate has been defined a little bit more specifically, right? Additional genes get switched on. Now you're not just head, maybe you're specifically going to become I. You're specifically going to become antennae you're specifically going to become mouth parts. So your identity and fate is becoming more and more specifically defined with every uh, additional set of genes that get switched on. Now you're not just an eye, you're going to be a specific neuron in the eye. You're going to be uh, providing structural support. Um, you're going to be uh, an enzyme that produces pigment right? So specific genes that are required to form the uh, anatomy and lead to the physiology of the eye, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on, on down the line, right? Getting more and more specific as we go. So this initial specification, very general, was initiated by our maternal effect genes. And then we got those segmentation genes that got switched on that defined more precisely what anterior and posterior meant all along uh, the anterior posterior axis. And from then we get these homeotic or homeobox genes that actually lead to effectors being turned on that lead to specific uh, body structures, right? So that's what we've been talking about. Uh, but the same sorts of morphogenic cues that we see happening in Drosophila development, um, they're also uh, regulating um, vertebrate development. If we look in mouse development, we see, you know, not bicoid and nanos, but other uh, related morphogens providing this kind of uh, positional information as well. And so you can have, you know, let's say an early embryonic development, you've got a ball of cells that are all fated to become some part of the embryo. And now this cell starts to produce a morphogen, right, some chemical signal, and secrete it out of the cell. Well, that signal is now going to diffuse away and is going to be signaling to the other cells in the embryo in a concentration-dependent manner in a very similar fashion as to what we see in Drosophila. Um, you know, as I said before, there are more things in common in our developmental program uh, than things that are different if we look at the molecular level and how this actually plays out. So again, this was, um, you know, two examples of different mechanisms of regulating gene expression, the expression of a gene's product, uh, you know, what's produced, where it is in the cell, and that actually initiated a whole host of transcription factors signaling that led to speci uh, specification of the embryonic body plan. Um, pretty much any developmental process that, that we could take a look at is going to be governed by very similar mechanisms, um, as well as, you know, if we think about those other mechanisms that are possible, 
uh, mRNA degradation, alternative splicing, uh, microRNA regulation, all these other forms of gene regulation also come into play.